Since Unity is focusing quite a lot on improving their tech for graphics, they've also published the new post-processing stack which is independently available for HDRP only. So in this video, we're gonna check out how you can use the new post-processing stack and how to enable this feature in your project and get started with HDRP in general. If you have any questions about HDRP and post-processing after this video, feel free to let us know in the comments section and also join our Discord server for more information because we right now we have over 10,000 people who like to help each other out. So go to the link in the description and join that community today. And also this video is brought to you by Simmer.io. Simmer.io is a website where you can upload your Unity games and it's incredibly easy to use as you can just register on the website and deploy your game as WebGL in Unity. And then you just have to drag and drop the WebGL folder from your Unity project into Simmer and that's literally it. Simmer is also launching a new site update which is huge. It's got an update to its layout, to the design, and to the overall ease of using the website itself. For the launch, which is happening 26th of April, so in a couple days actually, they're also going to host a jam with a bunch of prizes. So make sure to sign up on Simmer for free to stay up to tune on that. And in order to sign up, you can actually go to the link in the description or simply go to simmer.io forward slash Saiku to get started with uploading your projects today. And the first 20 people to sign up using our link will also get access to a four hour long Udemy course, which is valued at $119 for mastering Unity WebGL. Now, with that being said, let's open up Unity 2019.1 and take a look at post-processing. All right, so here we are in Unity and I'm using Unity 2019.1, the full first version release, so out of beta, and I'm using HDRP too. So in case you didn't know, I do have a beginner's guide on how to get started with HDRP, specifically just implementing it into your project and making sure that everything is working fine. So if you guys want to check that video out, I'm obviously going to leave a link to it in the description box of this video. But to cover that real quick, so if you have a pre-existing project right now and you want to implement HDRP into it, you can simply go to Window and enter the Package Manager. And in the Package Manager, you can go down a little bit and you will see the High Definition RP right here. And you can hit this arrow to the left of it and see all versions available if you guys want to pick one of the versions. But I suggest you to go with the latest one in order to get access to all of the newest features as well. Now, one thing people usually get confused about the post-processing in HDRP is the fact that it's kind of like a standalone HDRP that is implemented into high definition render pipelines. So that means you're not supposed to be installing this package post processing, which is the regular post processing stack version two from Unity. So HDRP no longer actually supports this. And that's because, you know, it has its own version, so you're supposed to be using that. And speaking of which, let's actually take a look at how you do it. So we're going to close down the package manager. And to get started with this very quickly, one, one thing that I do usually is I just go to create and I create an empty game object in my scene. And I usually call this like post processing just to make sure that I can keep a track of it. And now I'm going to add a new component to this. And the component we're going to add is called volume. So we can just go ahead and add it. And now, Number one rule, <laughs> I'm going to call this a rule, but number one rule is to make sure that we check is global. Now, the reason we check this little box here is to make sure that all of the post processing we're going to add through this volume component here are globally going to affect all of our game objects around the scene. So if we don't check this, it's going to, it's going to assume Unity is just going to assume that we're trying to create a local kind of post-processing volume, meaning that it's only going to appear in one part of the scene, but not the other parts. So for now, we're just going to focus on profile. What we're going to do here is we're going to click the new button to create a new profile and it's going to create an asset file. So if we click on it, you'll see that it's now in the in the demo interior folder of this uh, demo asset pack that I'm using actually, which is also going to be linked to the description, not sponsored. <laughs> so we don't actually have to care about the asset file too much, but just to make sure that you know it's creating an asset file and it's located somewhere. So if you guys want to check it out or move it somewhere, you can always do so. Now, the important part here is in the inspector, you can see that we have an info field in the inspector called, or that says this volume profile contains no overrides. So an override is basically 
I call it, I call the way I define overrides personally, maybe this might be helpful for you, is a subcomponent. Now, although that might not be the true technical term behind it, I feel like it's a good description of what it actually does. Because if we click on add override, you will see that we have a bunch of different things that we can add in here. Now, we're not interested in lighting, fog, exposure, and all those kinds of volume related subcomponents or overrides as they're actually called, right? So we're gonna go to the post processing field and in here you will see all of the post processing components or subcomponents that are available now to demonstrate how this works i'm gonna add the most cliche post processing to have ever existed in this world bloom so i know this this is like a double-aged word because some people actually most people <laughs> dislike bloom um, well, actually, they don't dislike Bloom, they just dislike using it too much. Which, in my opinion, actually makes sense, so I'm not gonna complain about that. So what you wanna do is, I actually, I, did, I don't know if you guys noticed, but I actually accidentally clicked on this button because I'm so used to it. But basically, after adding this, you will see, you will realize that all of these fields and settings are grayed out. So you can either click on All to make sure that all of them are enabled, or you can simply use the singular and the independent checkboxes next to the settings to make sure you only enable one of them at, at one time, right? But usually what we do is we just click on all and make sure everything is fine. So now if we were to increase the intensity, you will see that it kind of becomes a little blurry and bloomy all over, which kind of gives it a pretty nice vibe actually, I like that. So if we were to make it really bloomy and you know, gloomy and blurry, <laughs> all those fancy words around like 0.81 as a value for this field. And then we can play with the scatter setting to make, uh, to play around with how much all of these bloom areas are actually scattered around the scene. Um, and if we make this low, you will see that it obviously makes it, you know, a little bit more specific to your slide where there's a little bit more bloom potential. Um, whereas if we increase scatter, it's kind of going to give this blurry effect to it. And you can also enable or disable sub components or overrides, um, basically post processing effects, right? Through the checkbox next to the name of the component. So Bloom, we can just check it and uncheck it and make sure that it's enabled or disabled. And now the beautiful part about this is the fact that it makes it really easy to work with it and you no longer, like in post-processing stack when you're using regular Unity or vanilla Unity, well, vanilla, you know, not HDRP, the built-in rendering pipeline. Um, one thing you need is the post-processing components, so the volume component and the layer component to make sure that everything is fine. Um, but here, you kind of just need this volume component somewhere in your scene and it's going to be fine. And you can just keep on adding new overrides or new effects. So uh, one of the new effects actually that they just added is the Panini projection. So if we add this and click on all, we can now increase the distance field a little bit and you will see this kind of like, it's almost like fisheye effect, but not really because it's towards the camera, whereas fisheye effect is kind of like away from the camera. And they were some, at some point they were using the Panini effect for the heretic demo that they made. And you will see that it makes it look better because it kind of gives this like, camera kind of view to it you know what i mean because it makes these objects on the front stick out a little bit more towards the camera which makes it which gives it a little bit more of a perspective instead of having like a flat image um, of 3d objects laying in the scene right so i like it and now that we have two different effects here i actually want to show you guys the weight field of volume component right the main component itself if we decrease this you will see that it kind of loses the values that we set, right? So it's almost like a, like a gradient for how much it's going to affect the scene. And then priority is rather if you have multiple different types of volume components on various game objects and various parts of your scene, and you want one to be prioritized over the other because you, you're like, well, let's make sure that the bloom is not applied to the volumetric lighting, for instance, right? So that the fog doesn't get bloomy and stuff. You can always increase the priority of the volumetric fog, whereas the priority of the post-processing volume component is still set to be lower. So basically, it makes it really easy to layer different types of volumes. Now, one more thing that I really like about the volume component is the fact that we can, for instance, click on Add Override, and in here, we can create something like fog or lighting 
just as usual as we would in any kind of volume component, even though it's kind of blended into the post processing itself, right? So if you want to have everything in one spot and you feel like the priority doesn't matter and the, you know, the transition and stuff like that doesn't matter or wait for that matter, um, you can always add in like, you know, lighting and add in some ambient occlusion and stuff like that. So we can increase the intensity like this. And it just makes it really easy to work around the whole, the whole volume component itself, right? Because you have everything in one spot. And by the way, if you want to remove something, you can just right click on it and pick to remove just like you remove any other component at all. Now, I know you guys are really crazy about the whole graphics side of things of Unity and game development in general, because this channel is mainly grown through like level design, which is related to graphics and making it look nice and stuff like that. So I want to I know you guys are going to be interested in this. So I just want to give you guys a quick overview of my most favorite post-processing components that you could add. So if we just enter the post-processing field here, um, channel mixer, I usually don't use it way too much because I use um, color adjustments. So channel mixer is more like if you wanna add some exposure and stuff like that, change out the colors, you can use it, but I usually don't use it. So chromatic aberration is what I use. Um, it makes the edges of your game objects a little bit more like glitchy almost. So if I add this here and increase the intensity, you will see that it becomes almost like a computer glitch. You know what I mean? Like the edges are kind of like being pulled across. So this is also what they use quite a bit on, or actually quite a lot <laughs> on the Book of the Dead demo and also the Heretic. So that demo team of Unity loves this. Um, and I can see why, you know. So another effect that I love, um, color curves. Once again, I don't really use that too much because color adjustments is what I usually go for. And color adjustments, actually, let me just show you this. So what I often end up doing is I increase the saturation a little bit. So you can see that you can obviously make saturation zero or minus 100 in this case, which means that it's you know gonna be black and white, just grayed out and you can have it a little bit low to make it look washed out. But what I usually do is I almost have it like 60, 75 something, depending on the types of you know, game objects that I'm using and how shiny the materials are and stuff like that. So I don't want too much color, but especially for nature depending scenes, like where we're out in the nature, there are some trees and grasses. I really want that green color of the grasses and the vegetation to strike out. So I usually add some saturation. Um, but for this scene, I think we can go with a value like 68 that it's at right now, uh, which should be cool. Depth of field, obviously, to make sure that, you know, basically depth of field is going to allow you to pick a certain distance where you're going to be like, okay, after this distance, I want everything else behind it to be blurry or blurred out and you can choose how much blur you want. So for instance, I can enable this and we can set focus mode to use physical physical camera or manual. For now, let's go with manual. So as you can see, if we just increase the end distance, it's going to blur out more objects as we increase it. And then we have film grain, which is gonna enable you the um, noise effect. So we can add a little bit of noise using this. So if we increase intensity, I don't know why it glitched out, but you can see that we have some kind of like noise um, in the brighter areas of the scene. Lens distortion, I don't really use it too much, but it basically allows you to distort the lens a little bit. Actually, we can add it to showcase like this. You know what I mean? You can make it look like Panini projection, but not, not the same effect, you know? So you can make it look a little bit more weird like this. So if the character is looking through some kind of glass or maybe is in the water, this is the perfect type of effect to use. Lift gamma gain, I don't really use these too much. Um, you could try them, but I normally just go for, you know, color adjustments to make sure that the saturation is fine and the exposure is fine. So I don't really normally use gamma or, you know, play with those values. Motion blur, I'm not a big fan of it, except for when you're using it just a little bit, but motion blur basically blurs the objects that are in motion. So for instance, if you have a wheel, 
of a car and it's spinning, you probably want some motion blur on it to make sure that it looks more realistic. And it also works really well with characters running around and stuff like that. So it makes it look nice, but as long as you're not just using it too much. Now shadows, midtones, and highlights, that's what I normally use as well. And also the highlights, so the brighter areas of your scene. So in case you guys wanna play around with the coloring and stuff like that, like this, the exposure and stuff, you can do so, but I don't use it way too often, but like a little bit of exposure here, for instance, doesn't look bad. Split toning, I don't really use that too much. Tone mapping, I mean kind of, but shadow, midtones, and uh, highlights is kind of like taking that spot for me right now so I'm not really using tone mapping too much anymore. Vignette, yes, and I finally can pronounce it right. <laughs> I hope that it should be right. I mean, I, I don't know for certain, but you know, vignette should be the way to pronounce it. But yeah, this is going to add the kind of like filmic effect to the edges of your, uh, to the borders of your camera. So for instance, if we increase the intensity, you'll see that it becomes a little bit darker. But obviously you don't want it way too high up, you just want it a little bit like this to make sure that the most of the colors are striking from the center of the screen. It looks more captivating for people. And finally, white balance. I don't use it too much, but I, you know, you can always use it to edit the temperature of your scene a little bit to make it look a little more warm or cold by using blue, warm by yellow, orangish. And you can actually see that in the scene view, everything else changes as well um, because this is set to be global. So make sure you're careful with using this actually, um, if you actually you know, wanna use it. All right, so hopefully that should help you guys with getting started with HDRP and especially the post-processing stack in HDRP. I keep calling it the post-processing stack, but I'm not actually sure if it's the technical name for it, but it's basically the independent post-processing stack for HDRP specifically. So hopefully this video should have shown you how to use it and how to get started with it. And if you guys have any suggestions actually on what else I should cover in HDRP, in the HDRP realm and the spectrum of Unity graphics, um, let me know by leaving a comment down below. And once again, you can also join our Discord where we um, have a channel specifically dedicated to, you know, suggesting me ideas for videos, so, which is actually called video suggestions. So if you guys wanna join that, you can go to discord.gg forward slash polyrealm or simply hit the link in the description. And if you guys enjoyed this video and found it helpful, make sure to give this video a thumbs up to show some support and hit the subscribe button below the video to stay up to tune for new content. Also, enable the notifications, the bell icon, which is, I think, what it's called. Um, enable the bell icon next to the subscribe button once you subscribe to make sure you get notifications for every video because I'm gonna keep making some HDRP tutorials and graphics tutorials and level design and stuff like that, specifically Unity tutorials and how to become a better game developer and make games and stuff like that. So if you guys are interested, definitely make sure to turn that bell on. And now, before ending the video, I would also like to give a huge shout out to all of our patrons, Richard Stance, Kupla, Flu Joey, Bureau Die, MakeAGame.com, Couch Ferret, Glasswell Entertainment, Academy of Games.com, Terrorif.com, and John Funnel Grid. Thanks to your support on Patreon, I'm able to make more videos. So with that being said, I'm gonna be super active in the comments section and in our Discord server. So I hope to see you guys there. Now, thank you so much for watching once again and hope to see you guys there once again. And um, yeah, so enjoy your night and peace out guys. Fly with me.